Now we want 617, which should be 617. So no egg, so empty for 617. Okay, after that is 705. I have mm, nothing. Empty? Empty. Every summer, Bowdoin students continue retired Professor Chuck Huntington's long-term study of Leech's storm petrels by marking which petrels are living in which burrows and the dates their eggs are laid and hatched. Over the years, a thousand burrows or so have been mapped on the island. In this part of the island forest, known as the Shire, there's about 350. Ornithologist Bob Mock is coaching the students on proper grubbing technique, which is the process of feeling into a petrol burrow for a bird or egg. It does move off to the left. So it's a right, that's in other words, your right hand. Sometimes you have to think about which arm makes the most ergonomic yeah. sense. There you go. Oh, I hear it. <laughs> and what's cool about this is that this work has been going on for 50 years. And so even though we're like, all right, we're sticking our hands into the ground and looking for birds, like, but yeah, it's cool to be a part of such a long study and to have Chuck, who's 90, come out for five days and like teach us how he was doing things in the 50s. It's just like crazy and cool scientifically. <laughs> uh, adults? <laughs> Oh, yep, we got an egg. And the parents have gone off probably to find food, so the mother laid the egg, um, and she's out out at sea getting food. But um, the egg is actually okay, not incubated. Um, it'll take longer the less um, the parents sit on it to hatch, um, but it's totally fine right now, and it's very cold. If you were to feel it, it would feel like it's been in the fridge. Hold it up to the light and see if it's golden. All right, let's see. Oh, there's that bird on her nest. I'll be looking at uh, the weather variables that affect wintering grounds and how the weather on their wintering grounds affect their lay date, when they arrive on the island, and reproductive success, any of those variables. So we'll, we'll essentially be looking at weather on the wintering grounds and how it affects their life history. All of these variables are already in the database. But I'll also be able to use, using uh, isotopes on their feathers, essentially locate where their wintering grounds are. So I hope to cue in onto where these uh, sparrows are migrating to. From that, I'll extrapolate weather data and historical weather records to get an idea of sort of those environmental variables that are occurring there. And then so, sort of correlate that with the data we collect here on the island. This summer, Bryant is also assisting with the collection of data for the long-term database on Savannah Sparrows started 24 years ago. So we're going to put the third net up to make sort of a, um, a U-shape around that yellow flag. She seems to like to fly to that back spruce tree a bit too. So we'll just try to get in her way without uh, causing too much distress. Have you seen her? I'm gonna get crapped on, I can just sense it. So now we try to be a little bit stealthy so that they don't get too scared from coming close to the nets. Bryant, is that her? Is that her? Okay, come towards her. They will extract the sparrow from the net to take some measurements and draw a blood sample. Man, oh man. So I'm studying soft shell clams. What I'm going to be doing is putting them in different sediment types and tethering them uh, with a leash, sort of say. Um, so I'll glue this string to them 
and then put them back um, in different sediment types. Basically, out over there, there's a huge sand flat, and I'm gonna get big crates and sort of dig them into the sediment so that they're down flush, and I'm gonna fill them with either mud, sand, or gravel. Um, and then half of them are gonna have little cages of crabs next to them, and half of them will have just empty cages. Um, and then in each little plot, I'm gonna put five of these clams that are tethered, um, and I'll put them out there, let them do their thing for a while, uh, and then I'll go out and measure how deep they've gone in the different sediment types and then whether or not they're exposed to a crab or not. Several months after returning home and being able to analyze her data, Elsie explains her preliminary findings. The response did vary by sediment type um, and that the largest response was seen in the mud where it's the least costly to live and you're the most vulnerable to crabs or at least that's what my results are starting to show. So my project has to do with rock gunnels. They're small, eel-like looking fish. They go to about six inches long, and they come in a few pretty colors. Red and black, brownish colors. And these guys will stay above the water line at low tide and hide underneath rocks. And so they're kind of in a cramped habitat for the entire low tide. So I got a bunch of buckets here simulating, you know, like underneath rocks and we're just measuring how their body condition is affected by remaining in these kind of habitats for long periods of time. It's sort of a pilot study because no one's really done work on rock gunnels before. So we've had some incidents in the past with buckets getting swept away by the tide and fish escaping and stuff like that. So there, there's control buckets which are just one gunnel inside the bucket being fed so to make sure that nothing weird's happening just because they're in the buckets. And then the other next one over has a green crab and one gunnel in it. So we're seeing if they're competing or green crabs are preying on them or whatnot. And the last one has four rock gunnels in it because sometimes under these rocks you'll find two or even three or four gunnels in this tiny little spot. And we want to know if they're all managing to get food or if they're being outcompeted by each other. I'm also just going around the island and seeing where I can find these guys. So far it's been mostly on uh, open beaches under rocks on sort of soft mud all towards the western end of the island. At every low tide, Bowdoin student Shem Dixon and Kent Island director Damon Gannon take the boat out onto the harbor. Under the water, especially in the shallow areas, a thick brown algae is growing abundantly and is thought to be obstructing the growth of eelgrass or seagrass. Seagrass is really important for nursery and habitat for uh, lots of fish species. And this uh, brown algae is, is not and the, the brown algae sort of smothers everything on the bottom and can create hypoxic conditions, low oxygen conditions on the bottom. To investigate what's happening in the harbor waters, Shem is conducting a summer-long research project. He is first doing a complete survey of the harbor using GPS to collect data at grid points. At each point, he notes whether the eelgrass is present and if so, gives it a density rating. He also marks water depth, the time of day to record the tide, and identifies the soil substrate. He will also observe whether there's any brown algae. Out here, where the tide runs really strong, uh, the tide seems to blow all this loose algae out of the way, which keeps the bottom clear for the seagrass. So out here, the, the seagrass is much more lush, um, and you can see it reaches almost all the way up to the surface. But scientists are unsure whether the algae is invasive or a naturally occurring species growing normally. It might be introduced, it might be uh, a sign of poor water quality, it might be a sign of uh, just a, a temperature gradient, warmer water coming out of the basin. Because it could be uh, perfectly natural, it might be something that's been here for a long time. 
To determine whether there is more brown algae today, Shem will inspect aerial photographs of this harbor taken by a local pilot in the 1940s to compare the extent of seagrass then to present day levels. So this survey is, is just part of Shem's project. The other portion, portion of my project will involve uh, kind of some buckets, manipulations that we're going to do in buckets. I'm going to try to transplant some eelgrass into a bunch of buckets and plant them in the uh, intertidal. And then we're going to manipulate light and the presence of marine organisms and see, try to see what the effects of more or less light and what the effects of organisms that might clean the blades, see what those effects are on growth. As we were all settling in, the herring gulls were such a presence on the island that I, I did some work that ended up being poetry about how um, we were kind of settling into a lifestyle and how the herring gulls were settling in around us and um, the way that those communities were interacting. Uh, yesterday I was working on a piece, I'd been watching some of the petrol grubbing, just watching the way the birds moved and the people trying to grub them moved and um, comparing those sets of movements. Again, the human-bird interaction. Um, <laughs> I'm the artist in residence and I'm doing a project on creative writing where I'm exploring how poetry and prose and plays capture the communities on the island. One of the cool things for me has been incorporating a scientific vocabulary into my work. As I learn um, how scientists talk about what's happening on the island, I can borrow particular words or phrases that capture my attention. So I spend my time exploring and listening and writing. And I've never had time like this to write before. Being able to write full time is such an incredible gift. Now I'm working on a prose piece about how time works on the island and um, the ways that time here is different from time at Bowdoin or time in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm.